Lord, we thank you for showing up here. Thank you for accepting our invitation to come. Lord, you've, uh, you've prepared this place in this moment to hear from you and your word. And so we just want to uh, submit ourselves to you. Each and every week we come and we expect to hear from you. And this week is no less. And so, Lord, we pray that your word would speak life into us and build us up in the inner man, change us, help us to be more like your son, Jesus, build the character of Christ inside of us through your word. We invite your Holy Spirit to come and to work on us. We give ourselves over to you right now. He said, to let you change us by changing the way we think. So tonight, Lord, I pray that you would help us change the way we think as we receive your word as truth and wisdom and right and sweet and pure and perfect. We want it, Lord. For your word is as sweet as honey, even honey on the comb. It revives our soul. It brings joy to our heart. And that's what we want tonight. So please let that be. Make progress here tonight in us and in this community that you've planted us in. thank you for this, Lord. We praise you. Like the song said, we choose to praise. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Awesome. So why don't you uh, grab a Bible and open it to Matthew chapter 5. Would you do that for me? And as you're turning there, I want to tell you that I told you a big fat lie last week. Ha uh -oh. <laughs> ha! It wasn't on purpose. God sees the heart. You look at the outside. Don't judge me. <laughs> Listen, all those, uh, I threw the big Greek word at you, right? Can you turn computer down a bunch so it's not buzzing? Appreciate you. All those uh, big Greek word, that big Greek word I threw at you last week was like makarios, which was supremely blessed, fortunate, well off, and happy. Remember I talked about how the invitation has been sent out that Jesus is going to come preach and he's going to teach you how to be happy. And you're all like, yeah, I want to do that. I don't know what happened to everybody. <laughs> what, happened to, what happened to, yeah, man, I want to come and listen to Jesus preach. I guess they figured out it was me and uh, decided to go do something else. But uh, those of you that are here, I really appreciate you being here. And that makes a statement to the Lord. And for those that are joining us on Facebook, I welcome you to be a part of our family. Thank you that you are there tuning in, and uh, we hope that this broadcast is a blessing to you. But I did lie, and, um, and it was because we were going to jump right into the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and, and um, we're going to talk about the happies. You know, the, some translations say God blesses, some translations say blessed are, and so in other words, it's happy are. Happy are those who do this. Happy are those who do that. And so we're going to jump into the happies, and everybody wants to be happy. And uh, if I had planned better, I would have had Bobby McFerrin's song playing right now, but you all know it. And I didn't want to make you sing it every minute for the next two weeks and hate me, so I'm glad I didn't put it in the, in the computer. Should I sing it? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Don't worry, be happy. Woo! Right? Come on. I hate that song. Hate that song. Listen, we're going to jump in and we're going to do Young Jedi's in the house. We we're going to start and uh, we're going to jump right here in, in verse three and talk about happiness and how to be happy. Right. But but as I was reading uh, in preparation for for this weekend, I'm reading the beginning of the chapter just before chapter uh, verse three. And I'm reading the first two uh, two fir two <laughs> first two verses. And, like, there's something awesome in there. And I don't want to just neglect that, right, because I love you. I want you to learn. 
and I want you to grow, and I want you to see something that, that Jesus saw fit to put in there for us so that we could learn and grow in our faith. And what I found out is that verses 1 and 2, they are so much a part of verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It, it's all part of it. And, and in the ancient uh, manuscripts, there was no punctuation like this, and there was no verse numbers. That's what we've done so that you can find stuff. So I can say, hey, open up to Matthew 5. Three and you know where it is, but otherwise you wouldn't be able to know. So, so, but I, I realize that that's all part of it. As a matter of fact, um, some people think that, that God is so much in control that he kind of dictates what happens, and then some people think that maybe we have some free will and he responds to things that we do. And, and there's a big theological debate and all that, and I don't really want to talk about that at all, but I, I, I just, I would just say this, and it's just me, it's not the gospel, it's not the word of God, this is just my opinion, it almost, it almost seems like Jesus is responding to a situation that he created, so it's kind of both, we're non-denominational, <laughs> so, so he, it, it, look, he is intricately involved in this situation, right, he's sitting there and, he's, and the people are watching him and following him, and he goes up on a hill. Like, he's in that situation, so he's intricately involved. Um, but the people do have free will, just like you do, and, and, and then he responds and teaches some things, and you're going to see very much that um, it is sort of a response to what's going on in verses 1 and 2. And so... Uh, we're, we're not going to just jump right into Matthew 5, 3 and talk about the happies. What I want to do tonight is I want to talk to you about dating Jesus. I want to talk to you about dating Jesus. And so here, here's what I want. You might be wondering what that is. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is right out of the gate, but I want you to do me a favor. I want you to be involved in the sermon tonight. As I'm preaching through this message tonight, I want you to do me a favor. When you sense that the message is about you and you realize you've been dating Jesus... I want you to raise your hand. Can you all raise your hand right now real quick? Just let me make sure you all can do that. All right, so I'm not asking anything out of the ordinary. You all can do that. So when you, when you notice that you've been dating Jesus, I want you to raise your hand, okay? So let's just start here. We're in five, right? But, but if you look, I don't know what your Bible looks like, but if you look just to the left in, in four, uh, over in verse 19, it says, come follow me. Jesus, ex he extends an invitation out, right? He says, come follow me. And, and, that's a common theme in the New Testament. Jesus says that often. Um, he says it in Matthew 4, uh, like we just mentioned. He says it to Peter and Andrew and James and John. Uh, Matthew 8, Jesus extends that same come follow me to the disciple whose dad had just died. And the guy wanted to go bury his own father. And Jesus is like, no, 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 don't do that. No, you come follow me. Uh, Matthew 19, he extends that same invitation to the rich religious leader. Uh, Mark 2, he extends it to Matthew. John chapter 1, he extends that same, come follow me, to Philip. And in John 21, after having extended that invitation to, Ma to, to Peter and Matthew 4 early on, he re-extends that to Peter two more times. Twice he does this. And, and what that said to me as I was meditating on this is that sometimes I need to be called to follow him again and you need to be called to follow him again because sometimes we get lax and we need to re be reinvited, okay? And so the scriptures would say, just as you accepted him, so walk in him. Like just the same way you came, rush into the altar because you realize you needed him, you should be doing that almost every day and we need to be reinvited. I would, I would propose to you that Jesus didn't just uh, invite. I would say that Jesus uh, proposed. When he said, come follow me, it's a proposal. And we just think that he's asking us out on a date. And, and, and many people um, don't realize the importance of the invitation. Um, and they say, yes, sure. And, and, and they rush down to the altar and, and churches fill and membership roles get larger and it's all good. Or is it? See, I think the, 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 the understanding of the, of the invitation is of the utmost importance. And we think that he's asking us out, man. And we say yes to the date, but we don't understand. He's proposing 
and so and we say so we say yes as an invitation and and we come to the altar and all that but it's not all good it's not all good all the time as a matter of fact i don't want to i didn't really want to do this cuz i know we're going to go in order through the sermon on the mount i don't want to let the stuff out of the bag but i'm probably just going to skip over the stuff later cuz we need to talk about it tonight it's not just all good when you say yes to the invitation to come follow him it's not all good in the same sermon right here that Jesus is preaching, the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, just take a look there. I want you to see something. So he, he says, come follow me, and people are following, but then people do say, yeah, yeah, I want to be a Christian, and they come to the altar and they say a prayer. They might even get baptized. <coughs> Can you either... Lower the spotlights a hair or heighten them a hair because it's flickering again. And it's driving me cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <clears throat> awesome, thank you. No, it's still doing it. There we go. So in, in, in chapter 7, verse 13, look what it says. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell. I love this translation because they use ACDC titles. It's my favorite kind of Bible. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life, guess who's at the end of that road? Jesus, right? Eternal life is what he's talking about here. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult. Do me, do me a favor and, and, and highlight or underline or circle the word difficult in your Bible. It's very, very important. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. The road to Jesus isn't exactly just as simple as coming to the altar and saying a prayer. It's difficult and only a few ever find it. Let me, let me elaborate on that. That's driving me crazy. Jump to verse 21 of the same chapter. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. See, 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 the Bible teaches, and it's so very true, that if you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, right? Like, you've got to do that to say yes to Jesus. Like, I understand that. But what Jesus is saying here is that not everybody who does that necessarily is saved. Like, you can stand up and say, I believe... Anyone, you could come up here, I know that you don't believe this, but you could stand up here and say, I believe in Jesus. And she might not, but she could say it, right? And you might go, oh, well, she, she believes in Jesus. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that she does just because she said she does. Look what he says. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter. Do you see that there's more than just confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? I, Jesus is Lord. Awesome. But if I don't do what God says to do, is he really my Lord? Or is it just lip service? On Judgment Day, you know that that day's coming for all of us, right? You all know that? Okay, awesome. Just didn't want you to walk out and go, man, I didn't know that. Well, there it is. On Judgment Day, many will say, many, like many, many will say, not, not, not some, not a few, what? Many, many will say, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, perform many miracles in your name. Jesus says, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. Let me just say this. Your gifting will never override your disobedience. Never. I, listen, the scripture says that, says that your gifts, your spiritual gifts, are without repentance. So that means when God gifts you to perform miracles, if he gifts you to cast out demons, that's awesome. He's not going to take that away from you. But just because you're doing it, that doesn't mean he's pleased. If you disobey his rules and regulations and his decrees, 
but you're casting out demons in his name. He's like, yeah, that's awesome. You want a cookie. You disobedient. Awesome, you were cast out that demon. How are you to your wife? Awesome, you raised her from the dead. But he was hungry and he asked you for something to eat and you didn't give it to him. You get my point? So he says, the ones that don't keep my, my rules, my father's rules, they're not going to heaven at all. See, many start the race, but they don't finish it. Many date Jesus. This is where I, you know, I like to quote like Tozer and Spurgeon and C.S. Lewis, like these great minds, these dead people, you know, that are brilliant. I'm not doing that tonight. Many date Jesus, but as Beyonce says, if you liked him, you should have put a ring on it. <laughs> and that's the problem with us. The ring means commitment. The ring means commitment. And you guys know, all know wedding vows. We've you know, Jesus says you're not even supposed to take to make vows. You all know that, right? So we stand up here at Christian weddings and we make vows, and it's like, oh. He said, don't make vows. Just tell each other you're going to do the best that you can by God's grace. <laughs> right? Let's just do that, right? So, so but, but, but you all know wedding vows, and we've all had our vows. We've all written them and, and said them, and they're all different, and we go online and get our you know, whatever, and at the end of the day, they're all melt, you melt them down to this. It's you and me only forever, no matter what. That's what a commitment is. That's what a wedding is, right? That's what a marriage is. Yeah, but playing the field, kind of dating, that's different. That's we can hang out, but not exclusive, and, and, and not if it gets a little rocky, or if it gets a little complicated, or it gets a little difficult. That's why I wanted you to underline that. That's what happens when we date Jesus. When it gets difficult to follow him, that's playing the field. That's playing the field. And here's the problem with that with Jesus. Like, you can play field with a boy or a girl, but you can't play the, you can't play the field. You can't date Jesus because Jesus calls his church the bride. Right? He wants a, when, he, when he said, come follow, he's, he's asking you to put a ring on his finger. Right? He's not asking you to add him to the list of possibilities and, your, and, and several dates, okay? He wants to be exclusive with you. Okay, so let's do this. There's some, there's some back, there's some back uh, foundation. There's some back story. There's some, some intro. Let's look here for a second. Look back. Look at the beginning. Let's read chapter 5, verse uh, 1, and, uh, 1 through 3. Let's read that, okay? You there? Okay, so this is what happens. He says, come follow me. And then it says one day, and we don't know what day it is, and it doesn't make any difference, just one day. Uh, one day he saw the crowds gathering. So he has called people to follow him, and they are. So you can see that. They have responded. There's crowds gathering around him. And Jesus went up on the mountainside. See, he, he's ascending. God is the visible image of the invisible God. And if God wants us to ascend the mountain of the Lord, here's Jesus, the visible image of God, actually ascending the mountain. And he wants to teach, right? So he ascends the mountain, and he sits down, and his disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. It doesn't matter what the first one is, but listen here. Jesus gives, just says, hey, listen, I want you to come up here, right? So he says to the crowds, I I'm going up here. Now, the disciples ascended, but the crowds didn't. Do you see there's a difference? There's followers of Christ. There's people who think he's awesome and rock, but they're not disciples. Okay? The, the followers were stopped when it became difficult. They stopped, but the disciples ascended. There's a big difference. See, Jesus was about to pour out blessing on these people, right? They had no idea, but he was about to pour out amazing wisdom that they had never heard before, like for human flourishing. He's going to give them all the best advice on relationships and money and salvation and prayer, all kinds of stuff, on emotions, everything that you should know for human flourishing. All this blessing, all this wisdom was available to the whole crowd. Some bailed, some ascended. Some bailed and some Ascended. Now listen, we, we could pick on the people who didn't ascend, right? We could pick on them. 
And, and because hindsight's 2020, we pick up our Bibles, right? And if we read the Sermon on the Mount, we're like, oh, man, that's great advice there, and that's great advice on this, and the salt of the, we're the salt of the, of the earth, and, and how to deal with anger, and how to deal with adultery, and vows, and, and loving, and praying for your enemy, and how to give to the needy, and praying, and fasting, and all, I mean, just awesome stuff. And you're like, man, those, those knuckleheads, they, they didn't get it. They're stupid, man. They didn't go up there. They missed out. I can't help but think how many things we miss out on because we refuse to ascend. And we'll never know what they were because we never got there. And maybe someday someone's going to read about us and go, man, Marcia missed out. God, he extended the invitation to her, but she didn't come up and listen, and she missed out. How many times have we missed out on stuff because we didn't want to follow him when it got a little difficult. Someone needs to raise their hand. Come on, right? You're all dating Jesus. The disciple, faced with a difficult task of following Jesus, continues to ascend because they realize that the greatest blessings come at the other end of the greatest challenges and the greatest tests and the greatest trials and the greatest suffering and the greatest extended period of obedience. Even though you didn't want to do it, you know the greatest blessings are always there. And that's what the real disciple does. They push through challenges. They pursue in the pain. They seek in the suffering. We don't stop. We don't pull back, and we don't run away when times get difficult. But see, that's what most people do with Jesus. So I'm not picking. I'm just seeing it right here in this room tonight. This is evidence of this. It's not easy to, to forego the other things of this world to come and listen to the word of God. Because most people don't realize that this is the most important thing. They're playing the field, man. They're playing the field. I don't want to get ahead of my notes, but you play the field when this is just an option. When Jesus is an option of many. When something else comes up to please your want, your need, your purpose, your whatever, and you choose it rather than Jesus. See, here's the thing. Some people are not going to be here tonight to hear the word of God proclaimed to them. So what does that mean? If faith comes from hearing the word of God, what's up with them? Their faith isn't going to grow without it, right? But they made a choice. And I love them all. I'm not ripping. I, we're a family, and I, I, you can pick on me too. But somehow, some way, they believe that what they chose to do tonight is going to bring greater joy and fulfillment than being here. And someday, I don't know if I'll be breathing or not, but someday, I would love to be that pastor that doesn't have to say those things anymore. That the invitation to follow Jesus and be his disciple is sent out, and nothing gets in the way of that. And you ascend all the time. See, I think most people are playing the field with Jesus. In my experience, I think that most people have, they like the idea of a God. They like the idea of this ethereal being that lives up in the sky that kind of gives you some things and keeps you out of hell, right? That's a big one. And, and maybe it's your scapegoat when things go bad. Oh, I can't believe God will let that happen. We like that. And so with Jesus in our back pocket, we add other avenues. We add other possibilities. We add other boyfriends and girlfriends and lovers. And our Bible book becomes a little black book to provide for our wants and our needs. I learned something else here this week I want to share with you too. If you look there in chapter 5, the first couple of verses right there, where it says the, one day he saw the crowds gathering and Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. I I don't know about you, but I was always taught that Jesus was very, very busy in his ministry, and um, he needed time to get alone and get quiet with God, and so sometimes he would just leave, and we were taught that, and so that 
since we're supposed to be like him, that we're supposed to do that as well, that we don't have to always be paying attention to always ministry, but we need to take time to get away and all that. And I think that sa- taking a Sabbath is super, super important. I think that praying is needed. But I don't know, man. I have a different perspective on that now. Having spent these last couple of weeks thinking about ascending the mountain of the Lord and all things are provided on the mountain of the Lord. And I think that God wants us all to ascend, really. And um, I don't think he was dodging anybody. I just think that some people didn't put their boots on. That's what I think. I think that he went and he, he saw the crowds and he didn't just get away because he wanted to get quiet and spend some time alone. I think he went up on the mountain of the Lord on purpose to get those people to come up. I think that's what it was all about. I think he was really living out this visible image of the invisible God. I think he was going up there, and when he went, it never says, he said, no, don't come, I'm going up here, I need some peace and quiet. So it's a massive assumption on teachers, on a teacher's behalf, that's what they do. But here it just says he saw the crowd gathering, so he went up on the mountainside. Could it be, I would, just, I would just offer this for your consideration, could it be that he was just going up on the mountain to get up higher so he could speak to them all and he wanted them to come? Right? Was he, did, he, did he not want to teach all those people these valuable lessons? Did he not want to? Well, of course he wanted to, but they didn't strap their boots on. See, in chapter 4, it says that after he extends the invitation to follow him, it's all kinds of people were following him. I mean, just, just if, you, if you have your Bible open, look at the end of chapter 4. He's traveling throughout the region, and, all, and, look, and he healed every kind of disease and illness, and news about him spread all over the place, it says. So they've been, they, people start bringing to him all who are sick, whatever sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed, or epileptic, paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. and starts listing all the places. So yeah, he has a bunch of people following them there. Why? Because he was making their life easier. Right? He was healing and making, he was making their life easier. He was making their life better. They're demon-possessed, now they're healed. They're, para- they're paralyzed, now they're walking. They have epilepsy, now they're not. He's making their life easier, but as soon as they were faced with a challenge, in this case, climb a hill. Stop. <laughs> Brakes go on. See, as long as Jesus is making it easy for me, I'll follow him. But as soon as I'm faced with a challenge to follow him, I stop. That's a problem. As soon as following Jesus is hard. As soon as following Jesus is demanding. As soon as following Jesus is risky, I stop. I think we see the, the invite extended to all the people there. I think he never, I don't think, I don't see any indication he told them not to come. I think that he extended the, 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 the opportunity to ascend the mountain, but I think the mountain stopped them. That's what I see there in that story. And so the question is, what are your boyfriends? What are your girlfriends? What are your distractions and potholes and speed bumps, and what are your mountains that keep you from ascending his? Because we all have them. We all have them. I jot down four things. I kind of, this, this, this is when you're going to start. I'm going to see some hands go up in this room. I, can know, I already know it, okay? You can jot this one down if you want. Here's four, here's four boyfriends. Here's four lovers in your black book. Comfort's number one. Comfort. You know, where, you know where worldly comfort comes? Comfort is when everything is on your terms. That's what comfort is. That's, that's why we play the field, right? I, and I'm not even talking about with Jesus, right? That's why we play the field. Like, I, I, no one in the room wants to admit it, but when, they, when you were younger, you played the field, right? We had, we had boyfriends and girlfriends, right? We played the field because each date, each boyfriend, each girlfriend took care of a, of a specific desire that I had. Each one fulfilled a certain purpose. See, I want to I wanna go, I, I, need a, I need a couple of, of different opportunities here to fulfill, because this one over here, like, I like hanging out with, with him because, you know, he ain't much to look at, <laughs> But, but he's got a few bucks, and, and, and he, he's, he's, just, he's, just as, he's just as dumb as a doorknob, but he, he, he's good to talk to, and, 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 and her, well, she's just pretty, man. I just like walking around with her because it makes everybody look at me, and I'm just, 
you know, and, and I like her because, because, you know, she, she likes sports, so I can sit and watch football all weekend long, and, 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 I, I could, and she just shuts up while I do it, right? And, and, and I, like, I, like, I like him because he likes the outdoors, and he wants to go out and have picnics, and, and so we have all these different avenues, and, and, right? and if one of them fails to, to fulfill your desire for comfort and their, their stated department, right? You just fire them. You just fire them. Right? You just call in for a substitute, right? Call the bullpen. I need a new one. Bring in the lefty. That's what we do, right? When it got difficult, they stopped following him. How about this? Ephesians 5.20. You are Christ's ambassador. God is making his appeal through you. You speak for Christ. Whoa, no. You know, preacher, that's your job. <laughs> I like the heaven thing, and I'll go to church twice a month, but me? Speak for him? Oh, that's making me feel very uncomfortable. Jerry. Right? If I do that, she's not going to like me anymore. They might unfriend me. Right? Someone better be raising their hand right up in here, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm your preacher and I can raise my hand. I'm being honest. You pay me to do it up here. I don't always do it out there like I should. Someone raise their hand. Come on, right? It makes me uncomfortable to do that. If I do that, they won't want me in their club anymore. They might not ask me to lunch anymore. They might not take me fishing anymore. They might unfriend me or take me off Instagram. What will I do? Let me offer you this about being uncomfortable, difficult. Romans 8, 17 says, if, that's a big one, right? That's a qualifier, yeah. If we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Now, I don't, okay, I don't want to step away from that. I want to step away from that for a second because I don't, I'm, not, I'm not the oracle of God. I'm not the guy, okay? So I don't know. I, I don't know. I just know this. It doesn't say if we're to share in his glory, then we must be willing to share in his suffering. It doesn't say that. Does it? So it almost, almost, when I'm reading that, I'm thinking, man, that's making me feel uncomfortable because that's telling me that if I want to share in his glory, like if I want to be part of his family and glory forever in heaven, that I have to share in his suffering. Does anyone see that in the text? It's almost a prerequisite. It says if, right? I'm just throwing it out there for your consideration. Right? He says, if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. That, that suffering, right, that means being uncomfortable. I don't want to talk to her about it. They won't like me anymore. They'll unfriend me if I stand up for God and what is right. If you want to share in his glory, you must share in the suffering. That means that they might shun you. They might shame you. Jesus said they're going to hate you because they hated me. It almost seems like you have to suffer some to even be a believer. 1 Peter 4.13 says, every word of God is challenging. You know, like I don't even want to read this next one. I don't want to read it. I just want y'all to read it. I don't want to read it because then I'm held responsible. Like I'm accountable to this thing. Okay, I have to read it. You ready? 1 Peter 4.13. Be very glad. Eh. Be very glad for these trials. Can I just talk about trials for a second? It's a trial, man. That means he's testing your heart, not his. He's testing your heart. He wants, and he's not testing it to, so he can see what's in it. That's why he says for you to be glad. He's testing your heart so that you can see what's in it. Right? So when he challenged you to do something... He wants to say, hey, will you suffer for me? Right? He says, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. 
If you'll be uncomfortable, get out of your comfort zone. Do something for me. When I challenge you in my word to do something, will you do it or will you just object and rebel? Will you do that? If you'll do it, people might not like you. People might shame you and shun you and persecute you and unfriend you. That's the end of the world. That makes you a partner with Christ in his suffering. I don't know about you, but that's pretty awesome, I'm thinking. See, the thing with, with dating Jesus is you think that the other options are better. Like, you think that if you got tickets to the Gator game tonight and you went to that, that the joy and the happiness and the fun that you'd have there would outweigh the joy, happiness, and fulfillment you'd get from being here. Philippians 3.10, Paul says, I want to know Christ. And then he goes on, he's, he kind of tells us, like, okay, I want to know Christ. We all want to know Christ, right? I want to know Christ. You want to know Christ? Anyone want to know Christ? I want to know Christ. Right? We all want to know Christ. And he goes on, he says, listen, I want to experience his power. I don't want to just come in and listen and go, okay, I, okay you told me this story about Jesus. This, this guy from, that was born in Bethlehem, and he went to a cross, and he died for a sin, and that's all great. Fill my head. He's like, no, I don't want just that. I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. What's that mean? I want to experience his power. See, to know Christ is to know his power because he's powerful. All authority in heaven and earth is his. He's the greatest miracle worker that there ever was. He's the king of kings, the lord of lords. He's God in skin. He's got power. And so to know him is to experience that power. You want to see him affecting you. And you want to see him affecting the world through you. That's how you know him. Otherwise, you just know about him. And I want to be a church of people that know him because we experienced his power in us and him using us. To, to, to affect the community around us, that his power is being displayed in our life. And then he goes on and says, not only do I, to know him, to experience his power, but to suffer with him. To know Jesus intimately, you have to be locked arm in arm with him, suffering. Being made, man, did he, wasn't he uncomfortable? The guy gets whipped and beaten and spit on and mocked and slapped and killed and murdered. Talk about uncomfortable. Talk about suffering for doing what God had told him to do. And that's what he wants for you. He wants you to just do what God tells you to do, even if it means you're going to be a little bit uncomfortable. The great news is is that God, in his sovereignty, has decided that you are going to live in the United States of America in 2018, where most likely in your lifetime, you will not be persecuted in the way Jesus was. So So you get that going for you which is nice. That was Caddyshack right there in case anyone wanted to know. Comfort's a boyfriend. Comfort's a girlfriend. What about wives? Submit to your husbands in all things as unto the Lord. Listen, I'm not, all of God's laws are laws of love. They're all set up for your flourishing, even if you feel as though you don't want to do them. So I'm not saying you submit to a husband who's telling you to do something imminent danger, because that's that wouldn't be God's laws. God, God wouldn't say, Carl, I want you to do something that would bring harm and hurt to her. Like, that's not what he would want. I'm talking about when a man's trying to be a godly man, right? When he's trying his best to open it, read it, do it, the wife should submit to that, whether they want to or not. And I would even go this far, even if the guy's a knucklehead, right? Not intentionally trying to hurt, but he thinks he's doing right, he, but he's a knucklehead, like Herb. Does he tell you what to do in King James? I just want to know. Does he call you woman? Woman! (laughs) Submit, woman! You are a lucky lady. You are. I'm just, I'm just like that, I throw that one out there just because that's tough, right? 
I mean, I'm not a wife, so I don't know. I don't know what it's like to have to submit to Moses Robbins all the time. I don't know if that's an easy task. I don't know if it's a pleasant task, but I just know that God's word says that Meredith should. And if we're going to have a family that flourishes, that has to happen. So comfort is a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's difficult. It's one of our little side action, right? Here's the second one, plans. Playing the field means this is what I want, how I want to feel, what I want to do, what I've always done, right? But here's what putting a ring on Jesus looks like. Uh, go to James chapter 4, right after Hebrews. James chapter 4, the, the brother of Jesus, say half-brother at best. Um, look at chapter 4, verse 13. This is what putting a ring on Jesus looks like. Not what I want, not how I want to do things, what I've always done. This is how I do it. Um, here's what it says. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we, will go, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. Like here's a guy who's making a plan. This is what we're doing, man. We're going to do this. We're going to set this thing up. We're going to gather these people around, and we're going to do this, and we're going to make some money. This is what we're doing. And, and God's word says, uh -uh. Um, how do you know what your life will be tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little, then it's gone. See, what you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, that's the big one, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. Okay? Um, we make plans, man. All of us make plans. And not all plans that we make are right and good. I was reminded of Acts chapter 16, where the Apostle Paul is going around and he's preaching the good news. Aren't we supposed to preach the good news to everybody? Isn't that what it says in the Great Commission, right? Go, go make disciples of all people, right? Ba make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything that I've taught you. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Does that mean we're supposed to tell everyone in the world? That's a yes. Someone say yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, so, so when Paul goes in Acts chapter 16, he's trying to go to all these different towns. You can, name, you can read them. I don't even know how to pronounce half of them. He's trying to go to these towns, and the Holy Spirit goes, no, don't go there. What? But you, I was going to, but I, I thought it was best to, no, don't go there. And so, so, so like, God says, hey, I want you to go tell everybody. And so they're like, okay, we're going to actually obey what God says, and we're going to go to these cities, and we're going to tell people about Jesus so they can get saved. And it says that the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go there. So, so, so they were kind of disappointed, but as a result of that, i got to tell you this, as a result of, of God's Spirit saying no to them, to that specific plan that they had made, the church in Philippi was planted. And the church in Thessalonica was planted. I don't have to tell you how important those two churches are, right? They're in the Bible now. Two, the three books named after them, right? Big, important churches when our plans Failed. Have you ever had any plans and God said no? Raise your hand. Right? Was that fun? No. And when he says no, right? Moment of truth. Moment of choice. Now we're talking about the lordship of Jesus. That's what's at stake. You think you have a plan. You think you know what's best. This is what I do. This is what I like. This is what I've always done. This is what I'm going to do. And God says no. Who's in charge? Who's in charge according to your actions? Right. See, it's at that point that we have to decide whether we're going to keep our vow to Jesus as a bride or run off with another lover. Will you, in that moment, ascend? Everything's provided on God's mountain. So will you stay true? Will you be led and will you trust that blessing is coming on the other side of the nope? 
or will you fight it and do what you think is right? Comfort, plans, now this, money. Money. The love of it is. Do you know that money is mentioned over 800 times in the Bible? Do you know that Jesus spoke about money more than he spoke about heaven? Do you think God knew something here? I think he did. We make plans and we adjust schedules according to money. We make decisions and the money is at the core of all of it because we want to make it, we want to save it, we want to spend it, we want to get some stuff. Look, we, we get married because of money, we get divorced because of money. We move because of money, we ignore biblical conviction because of money. You think it's powerful? It's very powerful. And somehow, listen, how much? How much? Those two words. That's become the, the, the standard in our country for everything. Hey, man, how much are you making? Right? Guy gets a new job, how much are you making? Oh, I'm making good money. That's, that's the determining factor, whether it's a good job or not. Oh, and, how, and, and it, listen, how much you pay for this? Because that's what determines whether it's a good person or not, right? How much? How much? How much? How much? Everything is about money. Everything is about money. It's the new standard for everything. And that's not what God says. God says this, listen, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Godliness with contentment. Listen, that means money doesn't equal happiness. Jesus said in Matthew 6.24, right in this sermon, no one can serve two masters. You're either going to serve God or be enslaved to money. So there's nothing wrong with money. Money's cool, right? But if you're enslaved to money, that's a different story, right? Enslaved means that it, sh that it shapes your choices, not God's word. And that's bad. That's bad. When we make decisions because of money, gaining it, not losing it, what to do with it, if that's how we decide where we're going to live, what we're going to do, who we're going to be with, what we're going to do with our days, that's bad. Godliness, which is just living as God's word would direct us to live, that's godliness, as it pertains to money, is, 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 is this, okay? Here, here's, here's what godliness looks like. This is how God wants you to view money, how he wants you to treat money, how he wants you to handle money. Exodus 35, 21. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved by the Lord came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. This is not about gaining money, making money, saving money, spending money for myself. This is about giving it. How about 1 Chronicles 29? All the way back into the Old Testament. 1 Chronicles 29. Towards the end of 1 Chronicles. King David, you all know of King David, right? King David, then he had a son, Solomon. King David wanted to build the temple for, for the Lord, but God chose his son Solomon to do that. But King David wanted to help out because he loved the Lord. And, and he was a powerful man. He was a wealthy man. And look at here in, verse, in, in chapter 29 of 1 Chronicles. It says that King David turned to the entire assembly. Okay, so that means all the people of Israel, all right there. And he says, my son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. The work ahead of him is enormous. For the temple he will build is not for mere mortals. It is for the Lord God himself. Like, he was getting ready to build a place of worship where God could be worshipped and God could be honored and revered, right? And, and a place where people could meet with the Lord. Sounds familiar, right? Kind of like a place like this. And he was so fired up about that. He understood the importance of this thing. It's not for us to hang around, although we do hang around here and enjoy a facility like this. 
But this is for the Lord God himself. And so he says, this is, this is a value statement. It's this important. Watch. Verse 2. Using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for building the temple of my God. And then he goes on and lists all the stuff that he, gold and silver and bronze and jewels and this and that and stone and marble. He does all that, right? As a king, he has these resources available to him for the government, if you will, to, to gather up for the worship house of the Lord. And then look what he says in verse 3. And now, because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I am giving, what's the next word? What? I couldn't hear you. All. Oh. I am giving all of my own private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. Look at verse 6. Then the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals, the captains of the army, and the king's administrative officers all gave willingly. Verse 9, the people rejoiced over the offerings, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And King David was filled with joy. A couple things to be learned here. You know the Bible always talks about how you shouldn't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing? Like, you don't go around bragging about what you gave, right? Because if you do that, the person you told, whatever attaboy you get, that's the only attaboy you're getting. You won't get an attaboy from God, and he won't say thank you. I don't care if you wrote a check and put it in that basket for a million dollars tonight. If you go blabbering your mouth off to everybody in this room, go, I just gave a million dollars, I just gave a million dollars. And we might all go, hey, that's awesome, that's awesome. <laughs> you're stupid, because that's the best, uh, the best attaboy you're going to get is us going, hey, great, we're going to build a new building on you, moron. Right? That's, uh, you don't do that, right? You just keep it quiet. So God can go, hey, that was awesome, thanks, man, I appreciate that. So, but, but, but look, here's a little bit different. See, his heart was good. He wasn't doing it to get praise of men, right? He was doing it to set an example. That's what he was doing. He was doing it before everybody, and now he's telling the whole story about it. Like, so everybody through all of history would know, like, I gave everything I have. Not, not to say, wow, that King David was awesome. It's to give an example of following Jesus even when it's difficult. And look at it. It says the people rejoiced over the offering. Like, I, I don't know, but you, but most people aren't rejoicing when it's time to take the offering, right? That's just not what's happening in this world, right? Because money owns us. It does. Acts 2, 44 and Acts 4, 34, you go to the New Testament, same kind of thing. It says nobody lacked anything because everyone shared everything that they had. And they, 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 you know, nobody had a need because everyone who had land and homes, that they would sell it, bring the money to the apostles, they'd give it to those in need. Proverbs 28, 27. Whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing. But those who close their eyes to the poverty will be cursed. Cursed. Can poverty mean more than just financial? Aren't people that aren't saved, aren't their souls poverty stricken? Aren't they? How about Proverbs 11? Can you go there with me? I, I, I just want you to see God's word. Proverbs 11. I'm so grateful for folks that want to hear the word of God. and I love hearing pages turn and just sends a message to the Lord that you care and you want him and you want to change, you want to be more like him, you want to honor him greater. 1124, look here. This is crazy. Like This is so not what you will learn in economics class. This is so, so not right, man. Look at this. Give freely and become more wealthy. What? How is that? What? Be stingy and lose everything. Don't raise your hand. You know I always come right at you hard, right? Don't raise your hand. How many people in this room are stingy in their offerings and they're broke right now? Be stingy 
is everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Look at 28. I can't give because I need it for. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly, the ones who do as God's word says, that's what I just said, right? They flourish like leaves in the spring. 2 Corinthians 9. You're like, man, you're talking about money more than anybody. Well, Jesus did too, and that's why. And it's not because, listen, I'm, I just want to say this to you. I know everybody in this room. I love you all. If you feel as though I'm asking you for money for this church, Go to another church tomorrow and give them your offering. And that's fine. So I'm not talking about here. Okay, we got bills like the rest of them, but that's not the point. The point is not to get your money. It's to free you from being enslaved to anything other than Jesus. It's to, it's to get you to stop dating him and put a ring on him. That's what we're talking about. Okay, 2 Corinthians 9.6 says this. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. I'm going to read through 11. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. So that's why when we pray, we're going to take an offering here at the end of our message, right? And that's why we pray. You should decide in your own heart, like, hey, God, what should I do? Talk to me. Like, the guy next to you, doesn't matter what he gives, right? Who cares what he gives? Who cares what you give? Talk to God. You figure it out. You have a conversation with the Lord. What am I supposed to give, Lord? What does that mean? to? What, what does this mean to me? What do I give? How do I, how do I join you in this venture to save the world? What do we do? And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously, pro listen, this is important. This is a promise of the star breather. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need. That's enough, right? If that ended right there, would that be sufficient? If you gave and you provide everything you need, would that be enough? It would be enough to, for me. But he says, no, that's not it because I'm God, right? And not only do you have what you need, but and you'll have plenty left over to share with others. So it's not about making money, accumulating money so you can buy more stuff for you. It's to have more so you can give more, right? That's what you see. So can we just like, can we just stop for a second? Like in church, let's just, let's just be honest. Like it doesn't matter how far along you are in your, in your obedience to giving. When, when Mike Gregoire, who's not with us here tonight, he's going to be here tomorrow, but when he comes around with this little basket every weekend, it doesn't make any difference how far along you are in your giving. Like, you're obedient to it, you tithe, or maybe you, maybe you 20th or 30th, well, I don't know, maybe you're J.C. Penny and you gave 90% of your income. I don't know what you did. But can't we just all admit that it's not easy? It's not easy. I mean, I have to admit, and I'm not, like, I'm, I see, you know, right hand, left hand, not supposed to know, and we're doing it by example. Meredith and I, we, we give at least 10% of what you guys pay me back to the church every single month. Like, we do it all the time. And he provides for us like crazy, like all the time. Received a gift this evening from someone in this church that wants to be obedient to the Lord and, and wants to show love. That's awesome. So he provides, right? But do you think that it's easy every single month when you're this broke? Do you think it's that easy? It's not easy. I mean, it's not easy for anybody. I don't care who you are. Culture says you're supposed to make it and gather it and spend it and save it for yourself and that that'll make you happy. And that's why it's so hard. We're just fighting a battle every single week when we come here. Do I do this? Do I do this? I don't want to do this. I know I should do this. I don't want to do this. I play the field. I follow you when it says to do this. I'll be nice to people. I won't cuss anymore. I'll quit smoking, but I cannot do this. And Jesus says, come up here and listen. Here's how you should really view money and how you should use money. I want you to give it away. Yikes. This is an Everest for some people. Right here. Everest. Only this far and no closer, God. 
You can come this far, but don't get near my wallet. I'm not really sure that this whole is going to work all things out for the good to those who love the Lord. I don't think it's going to work out in this case. I need this cash for this. And when faced with this difficult challenge, many people stop following. They retreat. So comfort, plans, money. Here's the fourth and the last one, family. Kids in my world. My husband's my everything. Family first, right? That sounds good. And while the scriptures would say in many places that family is of the utmost importance, things like 1 Timothy 5.8, those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. I mean, I don't even know what, how much, how, how much worse can you be than an unbeliever? Like, that guy's going to hell. And, and, and God's saying that you're even worse than that if you don't take care of your own Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and lay your life down. He gave his life for her, right? So we should care for our family. We should provide and love and, and, and all that, and, and we, we need to do that. But is it family first? Is it family first? Well, let's see if Jesus supports family first or if that's just American Christianity of convenience and leisure. Um, Luke 14. Would you look there for me? These are the words of Jesus Christ, not my words. Don't necessarily like them, but they are what they are. It's what it says. Luke 14, 25. A large crowd was following Jesus, right? Here's an opportunity to really lay it on thick and get a huge following. You could pass out the offering envelopes now, man. Make some annual commitments to this thing. I got a big crowd. Things are working out. All these people, right? And he, and he, he turns around, and this is what he says. If you want to be my disciple, you need to hate your family compared to me. Boo! Right out the door. Everyone leaves, right? Moses didn't say it. Jesus did. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Comfort, plans, money, family. Four mountains in our life that keep us from ascending the mountain of the Lord. For boyfriends, for girlfriends, we add to our little black book as we play the field with Jesus. And all of that is to explain Matthew 5 3. You look there at the first beatitude. The first beatitude. God blesses, or I'll say, blessed are those, happy are those, well off are those. Fortunate are those who are poor in spirit, realizing their need for him. There it is, right there. They realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. They're poor in spirit. They realize their need for him, not other things. They ascend. They obey. They stay faithful. They're fortunate and well-off and, and happy because they realize nothing else in life will satisfy. Nothing else is sufficient to satisfy the cravings of your soul like Jesus Christ. They realize that exclusive loyalty to Jesus is best, and that challenges don't stop them from pursuing Jesus. But they press through the challenge, because blessing must be close. Right? Blessing must be close. That being part of the kingdom of God and enjoying all the blessings thereof far exceed anything this world has or could ever offer. And so they don't play the field. He is their sole provider and their sole source. And so as I close up here tonight, I just want to leave you with this. 
there's a story, and it launched our church eight years ago. And it's in Mark chapter 2. And it's all that I've said, all wrapped up in one story. Jesus invites Matthew to come follow him and be his disciple and become, he says, Matthew, I want, I'm proposing to you. I want to be your source. I want to be your only focus. I don't want you to ever call in the bullpen. I want to be everything to you. Come follow me. And so Matthew, he does accept the invitation. He accepts the proposal of Jesus. And the first thing he does is he throws a party at his house. He's so happy. It's almost like a wedding celebration, right? And he tells all of his friends and his co-workers, hey, come and meet this Jesus that I'm in love with. And they all come to the house. And Jesus is there with his disciples. And Matthew's there with all of his buddies. And when you know the religious people, they show up to the religious Jews that know all the words of the Bible. They got it all memorized and everything. And they're sitting there and they're eating. And I don't know which one of them said it, but someone says, he looks at the disciples of Jesus and says, why does your teacher eat with such scum? And Jesus chimes in. He goes, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't come to save the ones who didn't realize their need for me. I came to save those who realize they do have a need for me. That's who I came from. That's who I came for. So I don't know if, I, don't, I didn't see a lot of hands going up tonight. So I don't know if you've been dating Jesus or not, but I know he wants you to put a ring on his finger. I know that he wants to become exclusive with you. And I know that he wants you to love him. And he said, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. That when things get difficult for you, when it gets a little rocky in your Christian faith, when you open up your Bible one morning and Jesus says, here, I want you to do this. Mm, man, that's making me uncomfortable. That's not what I planned. It's going to infringe on my kid's soccer game. I need this money to run vacation. Oh, God, come on. And we tap out and go the other way. I think that just grieves him. And I think he's just calling you to ascend the hill and sit at his feet and stay loyal to him because you realize that if you'll stay loyal to him, That at the end of that sacrifice, at the end of that suffering, at the end of that obedience, at the end of that trial or challenge, something good's there, man. He said, I'm working all things out for the good to those who love me and are called to my purpose, who will do what I say to do. And even if you don't feel like it's the thing to do in the moment, to get to the place where you realize if I trust him and I literally do what he says to do, that blessing is on the way. Amen? Can we come to our feet, please? We're going to worship this great king. This song that we're about to sing, it's called No Other Name by Hillsong. And this is your opportunity to declare out loud to the Lord that you're not going to play the field anymore. That when it gets a little bit difficult or risky or, or hard, that you're not going to call the bullpen in and go to one of your other sources, one of your other boyfriends or girlfriends or your dates, one of the other avenues that provide for your happiness and your joy and your fulfillment. Like, you're not going to go there anymore. That you're going to stay exclusive You're going to be like Beyonce. If you like it, put a ring on it, right? That's what he wants you to do. Father, we uh, thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to share it with these beautiful people. And I pray, Lord, that as we sing right now your praises and we declare out loud that there's no other name, that we wouldn't just sing those words, but that we would mean it and that we would follow you 
in each and everything that we do.